All right, let's talk about chain lubrication. And this is something that's been requested quite a few times on this channel. Now, chains are an interesting thing because really they're just linkages which are connected by pins. Um, that in itself is a very simple system. But to date on this channel, we've not really talked about chain lubrication. We've talked about gears, we've talked about bearings, we've talked about cams, we've talked about engines, we've talked about hydraulics. We've never really addressed chains. So you'd think that maybe there's something special or unique about them. The fact is that chains are actually a very simple system from a lubrication perspective because mechanically, it's really just a ton of plain bearings in a line. So every single one of these is just the same system as a pin and bushing. So in the same way that, let's say, for example, at an excavator, you would have kind of like the bucket pin. Um, that's exactly what all of these chain pins are, right? It's a, a very simple system in which you have an inner diameter inside of an outer diameter. And that looks exactly like all of our plane bearing systems. Now, plane bearings, as we know, um, let's say, for example, from uh, turbines or any other kind of uh, plane bearing system, what we have is an inner diameter that as it spins, it develops what we call a hydrodynamic film, right? And so it kind of self-centers itself, it raises itself up into this lubricant film, and then you get separation between the two components, and that's what helps you reduce the amount of wear and friction. Now, the catch is that in a system like this, we don't quite have the, the same mechanics at hand. Because if you remember from our Strybeck curve, right? Um, so where coefficient of friction is on the y-axis, and this term Zn on P, which is a combination of viscosity, speed, and load, is on the x-axis, then what we say is that we move through initially boundary lubrication to mixed lubrication to hydrodynamic lubrication. Now, the key here that in our understanding of chains is this term N, and N refers to the rotational speed. So like I just showed, when the inner diameter starts to spin, it kind of generates hydrodynamic lift, and that self-centers the inside of the bearing. But in the case of chains, the speed n is extremely low. Because if you think about the way that, if you look at any of those individual um, pins, they are not they don't have a significant amount of rotational speed. In fact, it's really only when uh, we go through a curve, right, where the chain is curved, that there's any kind of rotation at all relative to the linkages. So what we generally say is, Right? Because there's so little rotation, we are spending almost all of our time in the boundary and the mixed lubrication regimes. And we know, for example, that those are tended uh, to be dominated by the performance of the additives. Right, So where we go into hydrodynamic lubrication, that's dominated by the base oil. And in uh, kind of mixed and boundary films, you know, the performance is really, uh, you know, in terms of wear as well as friction, is determined by the additives. So... What else do we need to know about these chains? Um, and how can we lubricate the chains? Um, and how can we get lubricant in there? Because the one thing that always strikes me is how little space there is. Like if you look at a bike chain, for example, the clearance between the pin and the linkages is actually quite small. And so what we need is some kind of lubricant that can get into that very, very narrow gap and actually provide it with some kind of lubricant. And this gets to um, the different philosophies behind chain lubrication, because there's all sorts of chains. We've got tiny bike chains, and we've got you know enormous chains that drive um, you know kilns and things like that. And then we've got and then we've got things like that very very high temperature chains that you would see in industry where there's much bigger clearances. So let's say for example, uh, most people would be familiar with a, a kind of like a, a spray can application of lubricant to a small bike chain, for example. So you have your guy over here, and he sprays it a bunch. Now, what we are aiming for there, where there are very tight clearances, is we're aiming for the lubricant to penetrate into that zone, right? And let's say, for example, a bike, we know that you're going to be picking up a whole bunch of dirt and muck off the road. So the aim of that specific spray system is to penetrate into that zone, flush away as many contaminants as possible, and leave behind a kind of like an oily film that can help lubricate. Now, the reality is, in order for it to penetrate, the viscosity has to be very low. We can't have a vis high viscosity oil because it will never make it into the guts of the pin. So we need something with very low viscosity. Often, that's kind of like a penetrating oil, which is like a mixture of an oil and a solvent. So it's very low viscosity, and some of that is going to volatilize off. It's going to flash off and leave kind of a dry film. So with a lot of these kind of um, spray applications, we'd ideally like it to leave some additives behind. 
And so generally, a kind of a solvent mixed with some extreme pressure additives or a solvent mixed with anti-wear additives is going to do the trick. Or even better still, maybe you have some solid additives that are included in that formulation. So you have, um, you know, kind of a bit of a solvent slash oil and it's mixed in with maybe a boron nitride or a Teflon that can remain behind to give you that wear protection once uh, the oil has flashed off. Now, this is not the only thing that we have, right? So um, we obviously have, not just in this mechanical system, we don't just have a chain, we also have um, a sprocket, for example. So there's something that has to drive the train. That's, so there's something that that is driving the actual chain itself. And with the sprocket, you know, it's not a it's not a perfect fit, right? There's always a certain amount of play, and we haven't even got into things like uh, ch- you know chain lengthening and stretch and all that sort of stuff. But immediately, right? Let's say, for example, I want this uh, this chain to rotate anti clockwise on the screen. Um, there is a certain degree of play in that sprocket before it is going to motivate the chain and move it, right? And so, um, we we need a certain degree of protection um, also between the sprocket and the chain or whatever the drive mechanism is because there is going to be a certain amount of sliding motion on the outside of the pin um, when it comes to uh, the sprocket moving against the chain. Now, when we dig even further into chain lubrication, we can see all kinds of variations. Like I said before, in some of these very, very large chains that you'll see in industrial systems, we need something that's very heat resistant. So maybe we're looking at a kind of like a synthetic ester or a, even a, you know, a phosphate ester style uh, chain oil that can really hold up um, under very, very high temperatures. In some cases, I've seen chain lubes which are in that sort of ISO 220. Uh, they might even have a viscosity of 240, so that's not technically an ISO viscosity grade, um, you know, 240, 250, right? And we're able to deal with that high viscosity because the clearances are a little bit higher. And so all of a sudden, an oil with EP additives is able to get into that linkage and provide additional protection. Now, the other thing about chains that we have to consider is what is the application method? So it could be bath lubrication, it could be a spray application, it could be in some cases, right, I've seen people just use a brush, right, to to lubricate chains. We might have automatic lubrication systems and we have manual lubrication systems. And so all of this needs to go into making decisions on the kind of formulation and the kind of formulation we use. Now, for most you know, general purpose applications. So if you're trying to lubricate a bike chain, for example, I would personally would suggest going with a kind of penetrant, which is a combination of an oil and a solvent and something that has some solid additives to leave behind that kind of low friction, but uh, low wear residue. So something like a Teflon or a boron nitride would work really well. If you're a professional that works in the lubricants industry, I can encourage you to go to lubrication.com expert. There's a whole website with a bunch of training modules. If you're looking to get certification, MLA1, MLA2, MLT1, VIM and VPR are all available for the low price of 100 bucks a month. And I'm also working on MLA3, MLT2 and CLS, which I'm hoping to get done in the next couple of months. There's a little community where we can ask each other questions um, and I'm always available. So if you'd like to join up, lubrication.expert, again, 100 US dollars a month.